you obviously deal with a lot of businesses, a lot of professionals in the industry. From your network, from your clients, from your colleagues, what are you finding that are the expectations for the future of the residential construction market? Are people optimistic, pessimistic, somewhere in between? What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, James, I, I, it's, it's an interesting time. And I think we always try to compare times to other times to, you know, Y2K, the crash in 08, all these kind of things. And I think what's interesting, especially about what's going on now, is that, uh, yes, we're all dealt kind of the similar cards that you're, you're describing. However, the company's kind of reaction and response to it is is really quite different i'd say about 20 to 25 percent of the companies i work with interact with are having record years record first quarters uh and and just kicking butt another 20 percent 20 25 percent are breathing out of a straw and you know suffering and they're blaming it quite frankly on, on the softening of the market so it's the first time that I've seen this real kind of dichotomy of the haves and the haves nots. And as I've kind of kind of boiled it in my pot and looked down to the bottom, you know, I really see kind of three things that are the difference between these companies. Uh, one is the, the folks that are out there having record years, They've been heavily invested in marketing and making sure the opportunities have been there. However, those on the other extreme, you know, hit the brakes, pump the brakes on marketing, and now they're scrambling to get the phone to ring again. The second is those that are the have categories, they've been working on sales, sales training, sharpening their acts, watching kind of what's been going on uh, in the market, and it is much tougher to sell in the present market where those in the past are still living in the order taker mindset. Uh, and, and again, blaming it on the market, blaming it on the economy. And the last, which is a little bit more broad, is the folks that are out there, uh, you know, making it happen, uh, they have their act together. Uh, they operationally are buttoned up well. They're not making as many mistakes. They're not having to spend a lot of time and energy uh, fixing operational things where the others in the other categories, you know, are probably still spending. They're working on new processes. They're working on a lot of things that they're trying to fix as opposed to just execute on what's working. So the summary of all that is, and, and at least my message from my, my as an evangelist in, in these things, is that, you know, it, it really is a choice, you know, which kind of category that you fall in. But I'm encouraging, you know, overall, when you look at all of my indicators out there, uh, you know, it, it, it's fine. It's not easy. It's not great, but it's fine and it's up to you to kind of make it happen. So I'm just, you know, it's, it's probably a, a pretty big calculation as to like why some businesses are succeeding, why aren't, and, you know, there's a lot of different pieces to put together there. But one that I wanna talk about specifically today is staff. You know, the pandemic revealed a lot of weaknesses in business from scalability to, you know, how much cash you have on hand, sales, all that kind of thing. But but staff is something that I, I, I don't know that has been talked about as much. When you think about, you know, coming out of the pandemic, which we, I guess we officially have at this point and sort of moving forward in this new environment that we live in, you know, what are the big challenges businesses face when it comes to their staff? So, you know, one of the interesting dynamics out there uh, that is, in fact, you know, a product obviously of, of the pandemic. And that is that uh, for a period of time, we were in this kind of remote work dynamic and, uh, you know, virtual activities, leveraging Zoom technologies, all these kind of things to kind of th move things along. Now, the good news is we're in, you know, in the, you know, in the home related things, we had a pretty major tailwind so that we were able to adapt and still, you know, have a lot of success in business. 
the, the bad news is that that's had a pretty deep impact, I believe, on the culture and the team. And uh, I, I bring that up specifically, James, with your question, because what's interesting when I look back at those companies, going back to my haves and have nots, uh, for the most part, the haves are also ones that brought their team back together earlier on, whereas some of the have not still, even at this point, local remodeling, local businesses, uh, they're still operating in a very much of a remote kind of dynamic and they're losing touch with each other. You know, this is a business that is a human business. And as much as we can talk about efficiencies and all these kind of things, not having that X factor of physically interacting with each other, I think is 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 so so important today. So I think you know when when time has passed, those companies are really challenged. How do I bring them back together? You know, the the, the employees have become very feral and you know are out there wild and escape from captivity. In many cases, they don't even live near the business anymore. So it creates a team dynamic that's very very tricky. Now, having, having said that, uh, being somewhat of a baseball fan, and of course, Washington Nationals, you know, did win the World Series several years ago, uh, I can't even name who the players are now. So, and they happen to be last place. So, so what's going on here? Well, when you let your talent kind of get away from you, uh, or you sell your talent off, or you don't make people your greatest asset, like I talk about in my book, you know, I think it's critical that, um, you know, you you do treat the team dynamic and you, you focus on that asset being the people if you want to be successful. But, you know, a lot of it is, you know, you got to have the right people, you got to put in the calories to you know, do the care and feeding, and then you got to invest in into the necessary training to help them be successful. And again, I think there's a lot of folks out there that have fallen short on that element. The ones that are doing well, I think absolutely, their cultures are better, their 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 talent is better, and their investment in their people is greater. So when you think about those businesses that are struggling and also, I guess, you know, to factor in the businesses that are succeeding to sort of give yourself some context, what's the better strategy going forward for a business that's struggling? Is it you just kind of cut your losses, hire new staff and just sort of try to implement right there in the beginning all these new values that you want to instill? Or is it a matter of you take people who are already familiar with your processes, already familiar with your business and train them up? Great question. So it's always easier uh, to, I think, kind of mold and develop people within your organization if, if in fact, they have the potential and the competency. Just because they're loyal and respectful to the business doesn't mean they have the competency to be in that role that you would like to grow them into. But I always encourage companies to take deep dive inventory of that first. And once you do that, then determine kind of strategies and plan to how, how to develop them. Having said that, if you're growing pretty aggressively, you have needs that are different, for example, than if you're, you know, kind of hunkered down a more modest size. For example, if you have a marketing manager that's quite competent, you know, work on them and develop them. However, they might not be a chief marketing officer of a business that is twice, three times the size that you are now. So you've got to keep in check, you know, can they breathe the altitude of a much larger business and really grow to that kind of potential? And if the answer to that is no, they can't, then you clearly need to develop from the outside. But I always encourage, you know, make sure that you're bringing in people and ask three questions. One is, can they do the job? It's all about competency. Will they do the job? And then thirdly, it's about, uh, you know, do they fit you, with your vision and your culture and your values? And if you can check off those boxes and the competency level is such that they can be that, I think it's always good to certainly nurture and develop people within. So in terms of that 
sort of training and nurturing? Well, one, to sort of gauge employees. I mean, I know you're a big proponent of meaningful meetings. I don't know if anyone would not be a proponent of that, but you specifically, you have it, uh, you know, very well mapped out of like you should have, you know, 45 minutes if you really want to dig into a subject like this or, you know, and so on and so forth. In terms of gauging that and then further training those employees, what, what might that look like? Well, you know, to, to share a story certainly that you knew uh, from the past, you know, many, many years ago, I was like, you know, many other people kind of feeling a little wary of all the meetings and the stress and what have you, and they were more of a burden than anything else. And a good friend of mine, you know, when we were off together talking about life and business, he told me, he said, meetings are your job, Mark. And when he said that to me, it was all of a sudden a light bulb went off. You know, I not only had to lead, but meetings were a vehicle for me to lead. So I had to figure out a way to create world-class meetings because that's your job is as a leader, you have world-class meetings. So I think you, you start kind of very broadly, you know, what are the goals? What are the vision? You know, I need to have very broad meetings, broad meetings in terms of, you know, overall company meetings, department meetings. Uh, I also need to have, you know, spending the right amount of time on time and energy on one-on-one -on -one meetings with people I'm trying to develop. What's typically a mistake a lot of, I think, leaders makes is the one-on-one -on -one meetings are very much about reporting. Yes, reporting should be 10, 20% of it, but it also should be about training and growth, but also focused on the future of that employee and what they're doing to invest in themselves and how you're helping them. And if your meetings really, you know, encompass those kind of elements in them, I think you're going to be more successful. And so if we talk about you get into a situation where you do have to hire new staff or you're growing and you just need to bring on more people rather than replace someone, you know, how can you position people right from the get go to sort of be, you know, aligned with your values, with your strategies, with your culture, especially, you know, it, it's one thing when you bring people into the office, um, you know, it's easy because they can kind of see it all around. But as you mentioned, you know, a lot of us are, road, especially administrative staff, you know, a lot of us are, are working remotely. You know, how do you best do that to actually get people to, to be aligned and keep them aligned? Well, I actually think, and, and James, you can appreciate this, but more virtual kind of meetings are not really the problem uh, in terms of having effective meetings. Matter of fact, I would argue having a, a group meeting where you have everybody's face on a Zoom that you can literally look every single person, those five, six, seven people, whatever, in the eye as opposed to around a table might be even a more effective way to you know, have a meeting. So I don't think you have to look at you know virtual versus face-to-face -face as good or bad. Uh, you just need to know how to do it virtually if that's in fact what you're doing. Um, you know, but but you know, with with all that being said, at a at a very thousand foot level with companies, uh, I I think it's important for everybody to go through culture culture training, and ideally, culture training ought to be led by the leader of the company. And here's the history of the company. Here's what our values, here's our vision, our mission. Here's kind of theme, so to speak, we live by. Uh, those themes I know in our business was critical to be able to grow from. And that's really the, 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 the essence of what uh, one of my books was about is what those kind of 10 commandments, so to speak, of the business are. But all that needs to be trained, I think, when it comes to it. Now, having said that, my next kind of part B to, to your question is having a great onboarding is, is, is super important. And I believe at least in the first 30 days, for most positions in the kind of businesses we're talking about, it needs to be intense. It needs to be controlled. It needs to be, you know, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day of real training. And that, you know, I think you that that doesn't mean that you have to do that training, but it has to be ma mapped out in terms of the onboarding process. And then I think the real effective companies they put it actually on the new team member to make sure they're on the right place at the right time in this 
you know, in this curriculum, so to speak, of this training. And then you have checkpoints literally daily with those individuals to see how they're doing. See, we have a tendency in this industry to grab someone and throw them out to shadow. You know, let, let, let me let you shadow. Well, that's, to me, that's code for make this thing last forever and not necessarily make it effective. So I think having a much more controlled ongoing, ongoing uh, 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 onboarding process that's intense, you can save a lot of time and you can very quickly see whether the person is going to make it or not or real or not. Uh, and, and, you know, these assets are way too important that, to, to not have the right kind of training and onboarding. Well, when you think about that, I mean, like having a very intense process and I totally get that because of course it like lets someone know like not only is this serious, but the owner's taking it seriously as well. When you think about through the future, you know, whether that person is on for the next year or two or however many, I assume there should be like retrainings or at least like, you sure. know, revisiting that point. How, how should businesses kind of approach that? Or at least in your experience, what are the successful ones doing? You know, I've always liked the, the word mastery. So in not only in, in my business, but I've also, you know, integrated it into many that I work with that, you know, you want to have mastery trainings, whether it's leadership mastery, whether it's sales mastery, production mastery, could be marketing mastery. And in these mastery, it's all about, okay, how do we take it to the next level? So, you know, you want to make sure that these trainings, I, I kind of follow a, a, a theme that is, you know, you, you, you want it to be, uh, you know, the right length of these trainings. So brevity, levity, and, and relevance. And I look at every one of the trainings with those three big boxes to check off. It's the right length of training. It's the right tone, the right, you know, let's not be, make it fun. The training does not have to be painful. Make it fun and then make it super relevant, not, not only for the attendees, but to the times that we're in. You know, when you're like right now doing a lot of sales mastery trainings. Why? Because sales is tough out there. And, you know, the, how you approach your, your, your sales trainings are, are different than it was, you know, a year ago with an order taker environment. So you've got to have trainings that are really addressing relevant issues, I think, today. And for my final question, you know, I don't want to put it all on staff as though it's like, you know, they have to be the ones that are sort of rising to the occasion. I also think business owners have a pretty important role, not only in articulating what their values, what their culture is, but also sort of embodying it and, and sort of showing it through um, action. If you could speak to business owners now, you know, what is the most important things that they can do over the next few years and beyond to make sure that, you know, they themselves are, 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 are living what they kind of preach to their staff? Well, this may be just a little bit of a play off the words, but I, I would say make it a priority to be a leader. You know, if, if, if you want to be a leader, look in the mirror and look at your strengths and weaknesses as a leader. Uh, you know, if you're a tennis player, you know, are you a pro or are you an amateur? You know, if you want to be a pro out there, be a pro. And a pro needs a coach. A pro needs to invest time on the practice field, being better at it. You know, be a student of leadership. Read more. Listen to podcasts. To, you know, have, uh, you know, advisory relationships of, with people that can help you be a better leader and, you know, put time and energy and calories into being a better leader. Uh, you know, in the 10 criteria of my how fit is your business, I was asked one time, you know, which of those 10 is most important? And it's kind of like, you know, someone asking you which of your kids are most important to you. So it's a little bit of a strange question. But I remember being asked that I had to kind of take a step back. And I said, you know, it's got to be leadership because leadership has influence on all the other parts and pieces. So my biggest advice for someone is be better at your job, which is to be a leader. 
Um, well, Mark, that's all the questions I have for today. I'd open the floor to you if you wanted to say something to our audience, um, if you had anything extra. Don't you know, I guess the only thing I would maybe close with, and this again sounds a little bit more like a preacher than anything else, is that, you know, think of kind of this industry almost like a apple orchard, you know, going back to 2008, all of a sudden things fell off and we had a major drought for a period of time. Then all of a sudden it started that things started to come back. We were having to figure out new ways of doing it. Uh, you know, we had a pandemic. I mean, we've never had that, certainly in our life lifetimes, and that was a major curveball. But all the pandemic did for, for the, the home industry is kind of advance things much more forward. But fundamentally, you know, I think it's safe to say that the home-related things are here to stay. Homeowners are not going to say, enough already with houses. Let me go live in a cave or something. So you just have to be better at it. And I think the more that you focus looking at the mirror internally at yourself and not looking over your shoulder at all the reasons why you're not being successful, I, I think that's going to uh, bode very well for you moving forward.